Good morning, everyone. Um, can I just do a little experiment before I start? Because this being TED, everyone should have their phones away on silent, obviously. But anyone that's got a phone in their hand, and this is not like a teacher spotting people chewing gum, can you just put it in the air? It's so pretty good. You're obviously massively advanced because you're a TED audience. But I think that, that's what I want to talk about. So it's just the intimacy of our relationship with technology and what that actually does to us. And I think most importantly, what it does to our brains. So literally, what is going on with our heads when we pick up a smartphone? And I think this, this came out of some research that we did. And what's fascinating is when you talk to people about their smart, everything's, we do a lot of behavioral research at Hey Human, which is a marketing communications agency. And it's normally normal, except when you start speaking to people about smartphones. And you say to them, do you think you use it too much? Do you think, can, can I just take it off you so we can have, and they're like, no. No, it's fine. It's absolutely fine. I don't need to cut down on it at all. It's, it's cool. It's cool. Just leave it with me. And I just thought, this isn't normal. This is a really strange thing. And so we had to start to look at this. And what, um, what also provoked me, which was a tough, tough geezer to fight, was this guy who's the god of advertising, Bill Birnbach. And he famously said, and bear in mind he said this in the 50s, it's taken millions of years for our behaviours to evolve. It'll take millions more for them to even vary. And so although it's fashionable to talk about unchanging man, uh, sorry, talk about changing man, we must focus on unchanging man. And I just had a real issue with this in, in that I thought it was bollocks. Um, and so... <laughs> I, you know, so I set up, and it's really, it's really tough to take this guy on because all the big thinkers in advertising are informed by this guy, and they just say, "Well, it's not. There's no such thing as new behaviour. Uh, it's just the same behaviours expressed through technology." And I think, bearing in mind, he said this in the '50s when all we had to worry about was TVs, radios, and this wacky thing called a record player. You know, I just thought he can't have anticipated what was going to come. And I think, you know, Volker's talk was fantastic in terms of just how fast this stuff is accelerating. And so I thought, let's look at the neuroscience on this. And I, I kind of, this is not my day job, so I'm not a neuroscientist. I kind of work in, work in marketing. But I thought we've got to get into it. And what I found was, was incredible. So I think, you know, the sort of headlines are, we all think of this as multitask multitasking, and that's kind of our cultural narrative in terms of what we think we're doing with these machines. But actually, we're fragmenting our attention, and we have very finite, precious human attention. I think the important thing is spending more of that in the world. I think then there's also this sense of responsibility. We absolutely have a personal responsibility to um, control the amount we use our devices and how we use them, but we forget about the thousands of, of people on the other side of the screen in Silicon Valley whose job it is to make you come back to that screen as often as possible. And what's fascinating about them is some of the modules that they study in terms of behavioural design is based on clicker training for dogs. So it's kind of, you know, that probably offends you as much as it offended me, but it's kind of, it's just that sense of they want that Pavlovian response. And um, my wife's here today, thank you, and apologies for looking at my phone so much. Um, but um, I think that's the thing, you know, and you, we, we see this all the time when my phone will ping and I can't, I can't resist, and I try to, but you sort of, I have to have a look, I have to have a look. And so that's really, you know, that's really what's going on. So that was kind of my day job, and then I thought, well, actually... This stuff's really fascinating. How, how, can I actually make, how can I make work allow me to study this more? So this is um, an amazing uh, visualisation by Gasly Labs called the Glass Brain Fly-Through. And this is a real visualisation of thoughts flying around the brain in real time. So these, these thoughts go at 268 miles per hour, which is faster than a Formula One car. And this, you know, the brain has about 100 trillion interconnections. So it's actually the most complex structure that we know of in the universe. And I, you know, the way that memory's encoded is thought to be a quantum process in your neurons. And yet we, so with this amazing, you know, the most advanced structure we know of in the universe, what are we feeling it with? Cats v cucumbers, Facebook, Twitter, all the time. And I just thought, you know, this has to, this has to be having a serious impact on our attention and the amount of energy we've got. And I think, you know, just looking um, at how that kind of, how that sort of racks up, um, and I'm really grateful for the Moore's Law introduction because it saves me time, but it's kind of, I think Moore's Law is just this sense that we've got this ever advancing march of machines. And, you know, that, this, that's becoming an increasingly vertical line, and that's happened over a scale of 40 years. 
You know, and Gordon Moore thought it would last for 10 years, but he's carried on going. And I think, you know, if, in Brucey terms, if we're higher or lower in terms of the brain, and this is a time scale of 20,000 years, how's the brain doing? How are we getting on in terms of our little noggins? There we are, flatlining at the bottom. Um, I personally blame Jeremy Kyle. I'm not sure specifically what the reasoning is for this, but um, over 20,000 years, we've actually lost a tennis ball size of grey matter, maybe at Glastonbury, I don't know, but a tennis ball size of brain matter. And, I mean, the good news is that doesn't mean we're entering uh, an idiocracy, Donald Trump aside. Um, but I think it just, it's just this sense of, you know, our brains are optimising to cope with digital lives. So, but I think the, the biggest thing is that the demand for our attention is massively outstripping our finite human um, capabilities. So that's kind of the main point. And I think if we just look at what that makes us... Um, this feels very true to me. You know, the Richard, Richard Foreman, the playwright, described us as pancake people. And I, and I just think that's kind of, that's how it feels. And it's, you know, it's really exhilarating though. So why do we do it then? And I don't know about you guys, but that constantly being connected to the, to the digital world is, is a really exhilarating thing. You know, I'm, if you get me in an eBay auction, I can't, I can't come away from it. You know, and I think that's, What's, what's unique to the brain is it's driven by this sort of cocktail of hormones and dopamine is probably the principal player in this, in this space. And it's really to do with task completion. So every time we win that eBay auction, send an email, send a tweet, we get a little hit of dopamine. And it's disposing the brain to a kind of reward system. So I, I think it's difficult to talk about it in terms of ad addiction, because I think that's an exaggeration, but it's definitely habituation. And what, what would be interesting as well is just a little show of hands, if you would. How many of you have ever felt your phone vibrate in your pocket, only to take it out and then there's nothing on the phone? Right, so pretty much everyone. Um, the good news is, you're not nutters. Um, this has actually been looked at medically and it's called phantom vibration syndrome. <laughs> it's true thing, I'm not making, Google this, I'm not making it up. And, um, it's because your brain is so disposed to the reward that, that sits at the end of your phone, you know, you getting your phone out and getting that message or whatever it might be, that it taps you, you know, you might get a muscle twitch and it taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, have a look at that. There could be something rewarding in that for us. So that's, that's what's kind of going on. So I think, you know, it's, it's really, we are digital dopes, but it's, it's what can we start to do about that? And I think the, you know, as I talk you through our research, you'll start to see what people actually frame it as in their minds that's sort of, kind of fundamentally wrong. I think the biggest thing we found, and we did research with old people, young people, male and female, and everyone says it's just multitasking. It just helps me control my life. I love it. You know, I can't be without my phone. I can't live without my phone. But what we actually found, and I'll show you what happens in the brain in just a second, is that people are actually not multitasking, they're task switching. So this describes flitting attention between screens constantly. And normally the screen that's closest to us will demand our attention, but as you do that, it actually depletes energy. You lower your actual attention, and we found from sort of single task, which is about 90% recall, to giving people a smartphone or a laptop, they drop their attention to about a third. And so all the time, although we think we're just multitasking and a bit like the phantom vibration syndrome, um, actually something much deeper is going on at a physiological level. So let's, let's jump into the brain and actually see what happens. So I think, um, you know, primarily when we gave people a, a, a single task, always quite rosy in the garden. So you'll see kind of activity at the front of the brain in the cortex, which is kind of the thinking part. And then it was cycling back to the hippocampus, which is the, mem the memory centre of the brain, we think, amongst others. But, um, and, and I think that was, you know, that was kind of fine. And in that sort of quite, quite passive but focused state, we got really good recall. What gets interesting, and you've heard the term brainstorm before, is what happens when they start to task switch. So as you give people a laptop or a mobile phone, it activates an area of the brain called the striatum, which is much more to do with doing things, engaging the hands and recall just drops off a cliff. And not only that, but in emotional engagement, um, and also, you know, just in terms of energy, they reach a stage called cognitive collapse, which is probably what explains reality TV. You know, we kind of get home on a night out and we want to watch stuff that allows us to veg out. And so I think, you know, if you think about the strands in our programming, it's kind of de decorating stuff, 
cooking stuff or, or watching people watching telly. You know, don't get me wrong, I love Gogglebox, but I think it's quite interesting to think of the reasons behind why some of the programmes we love are so popular. So I suppose that's where we got to. The big thing is now, what do we do about it? So I think that I just wanted to give you a few practical steps. I think, as, you know, as Volker alluded to, this train is running. We can't get off it. It's churlish to say, my kids aren't going to touch te te technology. They have to, to live in the world that we have. But I think there are things we can start to do. So um, a lot of people now have Fitbits. So we're starting to get into quantified behavior from the point of view of our physical activity. I think the big opportunity now is to look at how can we actually monitor our digital activity better? So there's a couple of apps here, one called Moment um, for Apple and one called uh, Break Free for Android that will actually look at um, how long you spend on your phone. So I've started using this recently and I found out that I spend about three hours a day on my phone. And, um, and uh, that, that, that basically you know, adds up to six weeks across the year. So when you start to think of it in those terms and the other things you could be doing, it actually makes you start to want to actually change things a little bit. I think the other part um, that's really, really um, reassuring is to focus on people, not platforms. And you, a lot of you will have gotten notifications recently saying, so-and-so is now live on Facebook that you just couldn't give two hoots about, right? And that's the platform trying to push their new functionality. <laughs> And I think what's really interesting, given that I think we have a clouded view of how we use technology and what it does to our brain, is the guy in Silicon Valley that designs all this stuff is called Dr. Fogg. There's no word of a like, it sounds like a Bond villain in his lair, right? And so he runs the behavioral design laboratory um, that, that trains people around things like um, the dog clicker. And he also uses this module where he alludes to a never-ending soup bowl. So there was a, an experiment they did where they fed soup from the bottom of a soup bowl to see how much people would carry on eating. And on, on average, people eat 78% more soup. <laughs> and so this is, you know, this is, these are the kind of conversations that's going on in terms of how they want us to just keep the need for feed the whole time. Now, the good news is there's a fifth column within Dr. Fogg's laboratory. So a guy called Tristan Harris, who's described as the conscience of Silicon Valley, so, suddenly had a Jerry Maguire moment. So he kind of left and set up a movement called Time Well Spent. And he's actually, I think, you know, the vanguard of something that's incredibly important, which is the realization that Silicon Valley needs to take responsibility for um, helping us change our behaviors as well. So um, he talks about moving your social apps off your front screen, um, charging outside the bedroom. A lot of people charge in the bedroom. It's like, oh, I need it for my alarm clock. No, you don't buy an alarm clock. So 87% of people touch their phone between midnight and 5 a.m., which is such a terrible impact on what we do. But I think importantly, empower people to contact you in terms of your notifications, but shut down any platform notifications. So that was kind of the advice from, uh, from Tristan Harris. And I think finally, and I thought about bringing this as a physical prop, but it would have been a very uncomfortable start for you. Just think about presence and purpose. So if technology is a tool, I think there's some social norming around what we do with phones that we wouldn't do with other tools. So if we just you know, replace that for a second with a hammer, which is also a tool, you wouldn't take a hammer out in a meeting and put it on the table, even if it was on silent, right? <laughs> You wouldn't, you wouldn't go to the toilet and go, oh, it's a wasted trip, I haven't got my hammer. <laughs> um, and you certainly wouldn't take your hammer out in the pub, you know, unless you wanted swift arrest. So I think it's just really thinking about, we do have this finite attention. It's so precious and we have such fleeting lives, we've got to spend more of it in the world. And so just coming full circle back to Bill, um, he was right. You know, I, I did all this research and weirdly, I expected kind of a digitised brain in the middle of it all. But actually, I found human beings whose frailties and need for connection has been amplified hugely by technology. But I think you know, we need to be concerned about the fact that we're unchanging in the midst of this maelstrom. So the train is running, absolutely. And I think it's how we direct it that's the next stage. Um, and that's me. Thank you.